Welcome everybody. It's our pleasure today to introduce Aaron Wolf Chambers, who will be telling us about computing optimal homotopies. Thanks. Okay, uh, please do feel free to interrupt. This is very much a survey style talk covering kind of a lot of things. So if, if you have questions, I'm happy to dive deeper, deeper or clarify. Okay, so this, this whole talk started uh, quite some time ago now when I was a graduate student and somebody held up their hand, this computational geometry person, uh, sorry, I'll harpell it and said, okay, so suppose I'm given, he was thinking GIS trajectories, but suppose I'm given curves and I wanna quantify similarity, right? So this is uh, something computational topology sort of loves to do is assign metrics and compare things. Um, now this was long enough ago that, that TDA was, about a year old as a concept. And, and so we're, and, and very much coming at it from a geometry point of view. Um, but the, the idea being that somehow these two blue, hopefully nobody's colorblind, I'll, I'll attempt to point. These two cycles are much more similar to each other than this one. Although of course there's tremendous subtlety here, right? You can talk about distance between them. You can talk about the, the actual topology classification of the cycles. You can talk about a number of different variants. Um, so, oops. There we go. So applications are numerous. You all are, are going to be believers on how many data sets we have that we apply things to. But again, what I had in mind was either 2D or almost 2D GIS type data or surfaces and doing parameterizations or quantification on surfaces of how similar things are. Now, the time I'm starting this, most of the metrics available focused either on geometry or on topology, right? Either you tested homotopy or homology, or you chose to look at geometric distance. So um, the, the settings, again, that I'm focusing on, just to give you the picture, two curves, polygonal obstacles, generally nice and classic computational geometry, uh, largely because we have a really rich set of data structures in this setting, funnels and shortest paths. And you know, because uh, there's many motivations for geometric objects in the planes. This is a really good setting to start with. And then the other one, and here's where maybe this is a little bit distinct. I'm not gonna be looking at real world data sets. I'm assuming you've handed me a mesh, a two dimensional surface orientable embedded in R3, really think the output of most of the graphics, you know, power crust style algorithms that attempt to mesh objects. So I'm starting with the very nice setting um, and, I, and then really deciding how quickly can we do things. This is very much focused on algorithms or the complexity if the, the notion is hard. Okay, so that's most of my setup, I think. So the first one in geometry, usually in your background section that anyone mentions is Hausdorff distance, which people are familiar with given for, for this setting, given the two curves here, and I'm assuming they're embedded in an ambient space, which we'll just do R squared for now. Um, you go along each curve and you find the closest point, or sorry, that's this one shown. This point's closest is over there. Now, of course, it's not symmetric. If you go along this curve, this one's closest is probably, you know, sort of tangent to the other one and much shorter. And the Hausdorff distance is just the worst case of these. Of course, there's going to be some downsides in a minute in that two curves can have very small Hausdorff distance, but from a GIS sense or a handwriting sense, or really any intuitive sense of topology, still not be very similar, right? These two curves have Hausdorff distance almost zero, but one is straight and the other wiggles. And in my world, those shouldn't be very similar. But th this is, you know, like I said, usually the first place we start. Okay, now with Frechet distance, um, this is a, a beloved and well-studied computational geometry uh, algorithm. Uh, they often call it the dog leash distance. Before we get to the formal one, you see, imagine the man's walking along this red curve and the dog's gonna run around in the park and they have some retractable leash connecting them. So as they walk, the leash stretches and shrinks, and you always have sort of a tight leash map there. <laughs> Formally, what we wanna do is get the, the shortest possible leash. So over all possible ways you walk along the two curves for all reparameterizations of zero one into the, the ambient space curves, um, <clears throat> take the inf of the max leash length. And it, it must be an inf depending on the space, because of course, depending on your space, you don't always have unique shortest paths or things might, the limit to something, but not quite exist. Um, but so for curves in Euclidean space, any dimension, um, this is a, I don't have the year, this is an Alton Godot paper from 90, 
94 or 96, um, which can do this quite quickly. I, I think this is a beautiful algorithm. So if you'll bear with me for a minute, I just have one slide and then I promise we get to topology soon. Um, this is a fascinating idea to me. So you've got two curves in the plane here. And what you do is parameterize them in a different setting. So imagine this curve here with what? One, two, three, four, five is laid out along the bottom. It must be six because I'm counting wrong. And the other curve, the shorter one with four segments is laid out here. For any S and T in your parameterizations, right? We have S here and T here. There's some leash length, right? That corresponds to a point in this parameter space having a value, the value of that leash. And then if you really want the minimum thing, you want to know in this parameter space, is there a path from here up to here, meaning you're forced to walk along the whole curve, both of them, um, that keeps the leash below the desired for shade distance. Um, so like I said, well beloved and studied, it's a beautiful algorithm. It turns into a dynamic programming approach on top of this sort of parametric view, um, which I don't know, I think it's lovely. Okay, now topology. So, okay, suppose we're not in Euclidean space. Well, immediately, if you have any curvature, shortest paths aren't unique. They're a heck of a lot harder to calculate. Um, so a, an immediate generalization, one of the first ones studies was geodesic distance. Suppose I just literally change it so that the leash must be a geodesic instead of a shortest path. If you go back a few slides. Um, and, and here's sort of the hand wavy definition. Of course, you can define this more formally in terms of tangent spaces, but intuitively, if you're in Euclidean space or on a nice surface, you think about just you can't locally shorten the curve. Um, so this is how they introduce geodesic crochet distance. Uh, this one surprisingly is much, much harder, probably because geodesics are harder to deal with. Um, so I'm aware of work on convex polytopes and inside simple polygonal regions in Euclidean space, right? The simplest setting that's got curvature, you can imagine just a polygon where things are not convex. Um, it's already non-trivial to maintain really the data structures necessary to track these geodesics is sort of the bottleneck here. Um, I, I'm not aware of any more recent work on this. I think the last published paper was uh, Carola Wink and her student in 2008. <clears throat> okay, now we're still not really doing topology because what I'm really interested in it is, okay, suppose the curves have to be homotopic to each other. So here's the stock definition of homotopy. You can imagine, well, that we're used to seeing the square of the homotopy, map it into the surface and somehow quantify difference based on the image in the, immer the, the immersion of that square. Now these don't have to be all that nice and, you know, I, I assume I'm in a a Zoom room full of topologists. So that's, everybody studied this probably or seen pictures of it. Okay, now clearly you can test if two curves are homotopic. Now keep in mind, I'm not to homology. I'll, I'll barely mention homology in this talk. I really want homotopy. I, it's, it's a surface. Homotopy shouldn't be that hard on surfaces. Um, so indeed you can test. There's, there's classic computational geometry work given two curves in the plane with obstacles, test if you, the paths are homotopic tends to be about at, uh, end of the three halves, with some log factors for the data structures. And if you're on a surface, what really triangles glued together, uh, there's a series of papers. So the first was Day and Guha, and then the 2011 was they, they found a, a subtle bug in the original algorithm and then published fixes to it more recently. So we can test homotopy. We can take topology into account. I can at least give you a bit of, yes, they're homotopic or no, they are not in these sort of common limited settings. Oh, ah, sorry. So what happens when I click on Zoom, something goes wrong. There we go. Um, but I, I'm still not terribly happy. If you think back to my hand from the first picture, uh, right? I, I really wanna quantify the geometry. Also, topology is not enough. These three curves are all homotopic. And again, you all have seen pathological mappings of circles into spaces. They don't have to be very geometrically similar to be homotopic. So this is sort of the core idea, um, which was a, a large portion of my thesis work and then has continued on, uh, is how do we quantify that? How do we combine both? Okay, so consider this sort of the intro and again, coming very much from a computational geometry framework, but all good. Now, if I take Frechet or geodesic Frechet, I can certainly throw that onto a surface, um, but it's not terribly happy 
if I think of, you know, desiring homotopy, because of course, I mean, even just think of a simple flat region with a, a bump, with a mountain. If you're sweeping your Frechet distance and fixing geodesics, you're allowing discontinuity, right? The Frechet leash will become tight over a geodesic. And as you move to the further along the curve, it'll jump discontinuously over the mountain. It never pays for the ambient space, right? So it, yes, you can define it, you can consider it. Like I said, this has been looked at for some settings, but it, it's sort of undesirable given that, well, on my hand, I really want you to have to pay to sweep over the fingers, right? That, that somehow should hurt in your quantification of similarity. Um, so we introduced homotopic for Shea. Uh, essentially the same definition, but instead of reparameterizations and shortest curves, we simply say the leashes must sweep a, a homotopy continuously, right? So you're restricting that you don't get to jump over the mountains. Even though it's not the shortest thing, you're gonna be forced to pay um, some technicality in the definition, but that's the high level idea. Uh, hopefully, at least intuitively, this will enforce both topological correctness or, or similarity and geometric similarity, but it turns out things get much harder. Um, so we define the homotopic Frechet distance between two curves as the infimum overall homotopies, where you take the longest, you know, sort of width of the homotopy. So as just in the plane minus obstacles, it's already not trivial because you have to choose how to wind around the obstacles, right? There's all these relative homotopy classes which choose to wind around different obstacles. And it seems clear, even for a fairly simple example, you're, you'll never be able to avoid winding around obstacles. We really do need to pick a non-trivial non homotopy class. So that's the, the formal definition we looked at. In retrospect, this is really just the width of a homotopy, right? You've got the two curves, you're mapping the leashes in, it, it's, it's the width of the square. Um, again, you know, Frechet distance is well beloved. So that was sort of our mindset coming to it, but, <laughs> okay, now this one turns out to be much harder. So we, we give a poly, the, in, in this 2009 paper, this was work from my thesis, we give a polynomial time algorithm to compute the homotopic Frechet distance only in the plane minus the set of polygonal obstacles. That's a pretty key part here. We start with the, the planar geometry and really leverage those data structures. Um, the algorithm is actually quite similar to standard Frechet. We're not doing anything terribly clever here. We're, we're building on that free space diagram and shortest paths in the plane and being able to compute these things. But the problem is we now have the homotopy classes, right? So if you fix a homotopy class, you can imagine that free space diagram. You can compute shortest paths in that relative homotopy class and do all the normal Frechet machinery that I, I didn't dive into. So just consider that our black box. Uh, but we immediately have an infinite number of homotopy classes, at least theoretically possible. Um, now, of the, the sort of the key observation of, in fact, you don't have to consider an infinite number of homotopy classes, is that it would be stupid to always be tight around obstacles, right? It, ideally, somehow a straight line segment somewhere in the middle minimizes something. Now, it's not clear, though, that this is surprisingly subtle because I, I sh showed you earlier, yes, they're straight line segments, but for large seg portions of the curve, you're still wrapped around obstacles. And these can get pretty pathological, right? So here's one where the, the homotopy is a straight line segment. There's a subtlety here in that I'm also not proving this green straight line segment is actually uh, in the, homo the homotopic crochet distance, but I, it can sort of constrain the homotopy classes I have to consider. But there can be a lot of these, right? The algorithm is brute force, try all straight line segments, build the Frechet diagram using funnels and geometric data structures. And you know, I, there's some quite a bit of technical detail to make sure all of those tools still work, but they do in the end. Now, I didn't tell you the running time. This is not my best running time ever because this could be pretty bad, right? So even think of two little zigzags here with a lot of obstacles in the middle. Well, any two points give you sort of a supporting line, a way to divide the two things. And those can intersect a linear number of things on either side, right? All of the red and all of the blue, the way I've drawn this, at least for a, a large portion of these. Um, so this gives us n to the sixth relative homotopy classes to consider if you want 
straight lines in the plane. There's a similar, there's a generalization to polygonal obstacles, which I'm not really touching upon. There you need to consider pinned things because straight lines don't suffice because you might not have any straight lines if your obstacles are overlapping. So there's no line of sight, but there, there's a, a generalization that works in that setting that we, we talk about in the paper. But yeah, this can get pretty bad. Here's another one that gave me nightmares for a while, two spirals and they sort of spiral around each other and all the obstacles in the middle. Right, so if you think about the relative homotopy class, with the straight line segment, well, clearly there's end of the six of them to consider, and it's really genuinely not clear. Probably you want one of the ones near the middle, hand wavily, except that the bigger ones have larger distance than the inner ones. So um, it's, it's genuinely not clear how to get this number down. Uh, so for each of these end of the six homotopy classes, you have to run something that's sort of like the Frisch distance quadratic running time. I think in the end with polygonal obstacles, it's about n to the ninth. You can look at the paper if you want. It, it was really a theoretical result, but in fact, some of these things work. We can leverage the data structures and it is a polynomial time question. Um, I don't know how to do this on surfaces at all. That hand picture is still open um, to the best of my knowledge. In fact, this, this thing right here, this lemma, this key idea of the straight line segment completely fails if you have any curvature, um, right? Um, immediately the straight line segment cannot be assumed in this way because we're, we're, we're dealing with the fact that even though you have obstacles and sort of there's some fake curvature in the plane, you're still in Euclidean space. Things are pinned and very nice and exist. So on surfaces, no idea. Um, we played with non-positive curvature for a little while. You could think of this question for curves in, in a, a, you know, any cat, cat zero or other you know, negative curvature space. Um, but the, the problem we run into is we needed funnels and Frisch diagrams and shortest paths. And all of those are things where we have very well-developed data structures in the computational geometry world. You know, planar geometry is well-studied as a surfaces from the graphics community. But um, you know, how do I do shortest path trees? How do I do all, all of these things? We just simply don't have the algorithmic tools in the same way. There's a, a little bit of preliminary work I've read, um, but it, you know the, the tools are just not there. Okay, that's homotopic for Shea or homotopy with. So I'm transitioning. Um, we could just as easily say, well, forget about the leashes, you know, like computational geometers like that. But really, if I'm thinking about the hand, maybe what I want to think about is how the curve itself morphs along. So take the orthogonal idea and consider this the height of the homotopy. I take a curve, I'm sweeping a homotopy on whatever ambient space it's mapped into, and I have to pay for the longest intermediate leash over all the possible ways to map that homotopy in. So the level curves for some fixed S here. Okay, seems fairly similar. It's not quite the same thing as homotopic for Shea. Um, this one, uh, sorry, this one actually has some pretty deep connections. It's sometimes called a, an L homotopy in the more Riemannian geometry community. And if you go to the more combinatorics community and talk about graphs and their duels and sweeping things, um, this is often called a, something like a B northward migration. There's some papers that study submodular percolation and graphs that have essentially in all these independent settings stumbled across the same idea. It's a very natural idea, right? You just, you just want to sweep things. How long does the, how big does the morph have to get in the intermediate stages? Okay, I don't know how to compute this at all. <laughs> Completely open, already we're to open questions. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, I will warn anybody tempted to work on this that I've been stuck on it for about 20 years. So we probably need some new ideas. Um, I, I do know that the problem is in NP. So this is a soda paper from three years ago, maybe. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk briefly about joint work with Arnaud and Tim, who are co-authors on a couple of papers on this topic. Um, the first part I'll talk about is actually based on Greg Chambers' thesis, no relation. Um, so he, his thesis was really differential geometry focused, and they were looking at this in the continuous setting and trying to figure out in a Ramanian disk, this is this L, L parameterization that I cited on the previous slide that's well studied there. Okay, so uh, when we're studying homotopy height, and, and I'm, I'm now thinking of this as in a Ramanian disk for, for the moment, 
Um, we have a continuous map. You know, maybe this is a triangulated surface, but I'm still thinking of this as a continuous object. We can still let consider H of I as our level sets, and we're looking for the soup over all those level sets. The interesting thing is you immediately get to the question of, does this thing self-intersect? And is it allowed to move back and forth, right? If I want to know complexity, somehow it's a bigger headache if things can move inward and outward and will twist on it themselves. And like, I'd, I'd like to remove these pathologies to have any hope of computing it. Um, so we, we swiftly get to isotopy, which here is just uh, a homotopy where all of the intermediate curves are going to stay simple. This is one definition of an ambient isotopy that we'll be using. So for the thing I'm showing over here is not an ambient isotopy because these intermediate curves have chosen to self-intersect, which is not allowed. So in Greg's thesis, um, they actually, along with his advisor, they actually proved that some optimal homotopy is an isotopy. Um, I think it's a really clever proof and it, it took me a long time to sort of understand it and he'd probably give you a better summary of it. But, but the highlights, the interesting thing is, is the tools that it uses. Um, Remember, I'd been stuck on this for a very long time, so I was predisposed to appreciate it quite a bit when it was finally solved. Um, take a homotopy of some height, and our goal is to show that it may as well be an isotopy, that it doesn't need to cross. Okay, so decompose it into pieces that cross. Look at where it crosses. So these, these quickly boil down to the Reitermeister moves, right? You introduce a kink, you cross over a different portion and introduce a bygone, or I have three things crossing, and their crossing patterns change, right? So if you're not an isotopy, these are going to pop up, right? These are sort of the, the basic, there's a reason they're studied and not theory. These are the basic operations that introduce crossings. Um, well, think about this. In, in terms of my input curve shown over here on the left, if I don't, if I wanna to prove to you that you may as well have done an isotopy, I need to prove to you that none of those crossings are necessary. Okay, so there's a lot of ways to resolve, right? This is the standard thing where if you have a crossing, you can resolve it this way or that way, right? You, you can shoot, there are two choices to remove a crossing. So just compute all of them. Notice for three crossings, we get two to the eight possibilities over here because each one can be resolved two ways. Some of them are bad. Those are my red ones because they result in disconnected curves. This is a homotopy, not a homology. It's not allowed. You gotta stay a curve and you gotta stay a simple curve to be good. So those are the blue ones here. Good, more or less. Okay, so amongst the blue ones, some of them are still not good because remember this original homotopy you gave me had height L, meaning no curve got longer than L. So in changing the resolution, it, it, it's not well-defined anymore. Just because the original thing was L, it doesn't mean this, if I'm gonna try to resolve all the crossings and make a simpler isotopy, it could get longer. So let's look at where it gets longer. Some of these, um, you can construct sort of nice isotopies of height L. So for example, if you're introducing a, a twist, right? This is the, if the curve had twisted and I'm choosing to resolve it by making a bubble instead. Well, if the original thing had height L, this one does too. You're not doing anything intrinsically longer in here. Same here, if you're introducing a bygone, right? This would have been a bygone and I'm trying to resolve it. I can do it without getting longer. But that same bygone, if I chose to resolve it a different way, even if it were a connected curve, it's not clear that I can do this and stay L long. I might have to get longer because it, well, there's just not an obvious way to do it, right? Up here, I have this connected to this and this connected to this. And down here, I've changed the connectivity all around. There's probably a way to homotope the curve to get that pattern, but it, it's gonna get longer, or at least it could get longer. So it's a very simple, look at all the Reitermeister moves, look at the ones that give you an isotopy or a valid homotopy, and then pick only the ones that have the correct distance for what we were looking for. It's a huge graph, right? We started with two to the N and now I'm removing things. Okay, so, but I'm, I'm connecting these in some graph space. Uh, now, so they build this graph. Vertices are these resolutions, edges are the trivial isotopies, and then they need to prove that there's a path. If I can connect gamma to gamma prime, then there's an isotopy rather than a homotopy, because I can choose a consistent way to resolve all the crossings so that nothing gets longer than L. This is a long portion of his thesis, so uh, lots of details are hidden. Uh, but in the end, they go by degree. They're able to prove that there are certain degree properties of the vertices and any two 
odd degree vertices, if everything else is even, even can connect to each other. Right? It's basic graph theory. If you have a, two odd degree vertices in a graph that is otherwise even, there's a path. That's sort of the core technical piece. Uh, very surprising to me, um, kind of shocking that it all worked. Um, and a lot of technical analysis to build this graph. They, they do mention the other ways to prove this using more differential geometry hammers. Um, I, I'll tell you, I'm not an expert there, so I don't understand them. But again, chapter three of his thesis is quite lovely if you want to go look at it. OK, now where we step in, and in fact, where we come onto the scene is in, in his thesis, he claimed also um, that you can always find a monotone isotopy. So not only does each level curve stay simple, this is an example where level curves stay simple, but it, in between, things can cross, right? That you might back up. If I'm thinking of this combinatorially and I'm progressing, you've chosen to zigzag. You've chosen to go back out somewhere and come back in again, right? So this is what we needed to prove to be starting to consider complexity. Because if you zigzag, well, do you zigzag infinitely? If it is it NP hard? I don't even know how to quantify it if you're allowed to go back and forth. Um, now, these don't always exist. So if you think about this example for a minute, here's a blue curve, which stretches beyond behind the big mountains and sort of in front of this plateau here. And there's another little curve up here. Okay, if you want a monotone one, one that's not allowed to move back and forth, well, all you can do is move over this big hill with this piece of the curve. And then on the other side, you're here. And then you imagine sort of condensing it into here and moving up, oops, sorry, until you reach this little curve, right? So the longest, and I'm, I'm hand waving vigorously, although you can put the metric to make this precise, is that you pay the cost of this long blue one, plus at some point, the cost of sweeping over the mountain. That's sort of intuitively your longest intermediate curve is all the way up the mountain and down, and then whatever this bottom thing is. Okay, now, alternatively, if you're allowed to wiggle and not just move forward, Instead, I could take this piece of the blue curve, which is, is sort of stretching around, and pull it over the tiny mountain. The tiny mountain is deliberately looking tinier than this big one. So the, the overall max height as you pull backwards, you wind up back here, right? So you're, you're, here's where, I guess I could even annotate some good things about Zoom. If you were to, oops, to wiggle this back over, eventually you'd probably shorten to something that's as short as possible here, where you've got this back curve and then you're winding around. Okay, this L is less than this L prime if I toggle my geometry the right way. I mean, it even looks shorter. I set the metric accordingly. I get to build my counter example as I will. Um, and then once you're here, now sweep over the mountain and get to here. So your total cost didn't pay for L prime. It paid for something lower and then had to pay to stretch over. That's less than the monotone version, right? The monotone version had to pay L prime as opposed to L and still had to sweep over the mountain. Now, once you've swept over the mountain here, you still have to move back over because eventually you want to get to this curve and slide it up to the other one. Uh, so some hand waving there. But what you've done is move over this particular hill twice. I backed up and I moved forward. So this question of monotonicity, would you ever intersect one of the prior level curves is pretty subtle. You can't hope to have it be monotone because I've just drawn you an example where it's not. Now, what we're able to prove is that if you start from the boundary of the disk, it will stay monotone. So if instead of that blue curve, I started you here at the boundary, you actually won't zigzag, right? You have the flexibility to move over anything in any sort of pattern you want. And so in, in fact, there's still hope that it's monotone for the simpler setting. Okay, here's the downside where I have to fix things. Okay. Bah. My desktop is out of control. Now, what we show is that if you start at the boundary of the disk, in fact, you always have a monotone homotopy. And we, we do it sort of inductively, computer scientists in the mix. Uh, look at where it has to zigzag, right? Look at the first place it backs up. Right, so 
you start with the curve, you've moved inward. At some point, you're choosing to move back out again locally. Um, what does that look like if I just restrict myself to the two level curves? You've chosen to, to cross yourself somehow. Some later curve is crossing yourself. So the crux of the argument that you don't have to do this boils down to, well, don't cross yourself, shortcut. This requires some really careful, subtle case analysis that you can always break up the homotopy at shortest things and shortcut along those shortest things. And therefore you never have to zigzag backwards. Um, and then, it, you know, this is showing it for one of the things, right? Basically we can remove this piece of the backing up and go straight from gamma to gamma two or gamma three. And inductively we can handle any number of these things. Okay, that's more of a preview for the paper if you want to see the details. <laughs> um, now, in, in looking at complexity, I can't hope to study continuous objects. So I'm going to discretize it. I'm going to turn it into a graph problem. And this is its own fascinating swath of problems. If you discretize a homotopy, what do you even mean by a discrete homotopy? So the version we settled on was close to what this D northward migration from the combinatoric side was looking at, which is you're allowed to move across spaces. So if you're on some triangle, you're allowed to flip so that now you're on the other side of the triangle. If you're touching some face, you can sweep to include the face or not include the face, and you can spike across edges. So this is meant to repeat this edge twice. Now, it's not clear you need spikes, and there's some subtleties about whether you allow them, but certainly homotopies can do that, right? You're allowed to sort of go in a narrow, thin tunnel to sweep over something big while you're short and then pull tight. Uh, so we can't rule out that you need spikes and face flips in this setting. All right, now <clears throat> this then becomes how long does a path need to be in order to sweep a disk or annulus? This looks very for shape like, but we're fixed inside of a graph. Now there's a lot of variance. I can fix boundary to boundary curves. I can start from an outer boundary and sweep in. It turns out you even get technical difficulties or technical differences if it's triangulation because that corresponds to a three regular graph and those have particularly nice combinatorial properties if you've studied graph algorithms. Um, so there's there's a lot of variance going on. Um, now, I still can't assume it's monotone. I, I think this is an interesting example. So it, here's a graph, a very pathological one, but I could make it nicer if you want, where I'm starting with this black bold curve of weight 10, right? Here's the five that's meant to be this bold, and I join it with a cycle over here that's five. My goal is to shrink this to nothing. It's a trivial thing. So show me the homotopy that is minimum that shrinks this to nothing. Now, these are just faces. Each, each bygone is a face. So I'm, I'm toggling the weights so that I'd like to know if there's a homotopy of weight 11. So I'm only giving you enough leash to increase it by one. You start at 10, you're allowed to go up to 11. And the question is, does that suffice? Is the homotopy height of this particular cycle 11? It is, but it forces you to work for it, right? So from this five, you have just enough room to slide to six and then go down to four. Four over here gives you just enough room to slide into this half and then down again to four. Now you don't have enough room to go to the eight. So now you back up until you get to the three. Over here from the four, that then gives you enough room to get out to this three, which gives you enough room to move in down here to the two. It, it's carefully set up. And, and I think you have to stare at it a while if you're curious, but this in fact forces log n zigzags for the bygone complexity n. You really, really have to work to get a homotopy of weight 11, even in a simple graph. Not at all obvious if you allow weights. Um, this is really a, a, like if I started from the boundary, I still have some discretized version of a Ramanian disk and it would be monotone. But if I start in the middle, it's much harder, right? And this is bad news because I wanna be on a mesh. I want, I want cycles on a hand. Those aren't boundary to boundary, right? You, you need to find the right annulus to start to argue about being able to compute this, unfortunately. Okay, now monotonicity in the Ramanian setting does imply that face will flip only once, but this the edges are spikes and that's a different beast entirely. And so the, the soda paper showing that this problem is in NP um, is essentially a complex case analysis of simplifying spikes. If you spike too many times over an edge, I can shortcut. This is just one of the figures <laughs> showing the case analysis. Um, but in the end, we, we can show that no edge is spiked more than a quadratic number of times. 
this is again a vastly unsatisfying bound. You should not spike over an edge more than four times, but the best we could do was show quadratic. And, and again, our goal here was just to study the complexity. We knew this was not gonna be practical yet. Okay, now this actually, it turns out connects to homotopic Frechet on more complicated settings because here I'm thinking Frechet distance. I'm walking along P and I'm walking along Q and here's my leashes that start blue and they end red. Well, if you cone these things off and build a new complex K, now it's homotopy height, right? Any intermediate cycle that I'm shrinking down to the other cycle uses one of these leash maps. So it turns out there's some very subtle connections depending on your input setting between the height and the width, not too surprisingly. Okay, now this has, and maybe I won't talk about this. We have a more recent graph drawing paper exploring the combinatorial side of this. It turns out, it connects really naturally to graph parameters. Um, and, and I'll just talk about one of them, in fact, because I think I'm, I'm nearing the end here. If you'll humor me for one more pretty picture. Um, I can look at dual graphs, right? The, the homotopy height or width in the planar graph corresponds to something in the dual graph also. These face flips are sort of moving dual faces. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming most people have seen dual complexes. It's really just cohomology. It's just a, flipping things. Um, so if I dualize the graph, I have now a very combinatorial problem. If I want to sweep across faces, that's a, a known graph parameter. In fact, um, this is cut width, right? Cut width is one of these other min-max graph theory parameters. You want to lay out the graph linearly and minimize the things cut. So if we look at the dual of a home, so over here is a homotopy height problem, and the, the colored graph is the dual graph I'm showing here. A, an et, edge, or sorry, a leash from, say, from this vertex down to the bottom, if I'm trying to sweep across, would cross the blue edge, and then the light pink here, pink, orange, and then the purple. Well, over here, that's the same as this, right? I'm choosing to cross the blue one, that's this dual edge, and then the, the pink one here, and then the purple one here. So when you study cut width, the dual of homotopy height looks really, really, really close. Um, now, the NP hardness for cut width alters embeddings. It doesn't hold rotation systems fixed. It's not the same surface or, or planar graph. So I don't know that homotopy height is NP hard. I, I had hopes for years this would pan out. But if you dig up this proof, the reduction does not hold for our setting. It's, it's fundamentally related, but a little bit different just different enough that I don't know how to prove it. Um, but this sort of motivates this host of graph. We talk about visibility representations. We talk about sort of layouts and graph height in the graph drawing community. You know, if you wanna know, is there a planar straight line drawing of height H? Well, this looks like sweeping, right? This looks like homotopy height. And there's some really, really interesting connections in the graph theory parameters. Um, I'll, I'll skip nodes searching or sweeping. This is yet another graph parameter that turns out to be connected. Um, and then you can, you can finally, in my last couple of slides, look at homology if you want to. Clearly homology is different. All homotopies are homologies, but not vice versa. Uh, but it is more tractable. The, the last four days show this, right? You can give ni much nicer theoretical results than I can for homotopy. Um, and in particular, we can even just look at Z2 homology, homo homology, homology, on a surface, and we're really just talking about cut graphs from the graph theory side of things, right? Two things are Z2 homologous if and only if their union is a cut on the surface, no matter what it looks like or how messy it is. Um, this comes back to that picture I showed earlier where I said, well, this sort of looks like a leash map. Finally, we figured out you're not doing homotopy height. Um, you're really doing cut width of homo cut width is the dual problem to homology on a graph, um, which is satisfying recent progress because it, it, it wasn't obvious to me. Uh, it has to do with whether you allow spikes and if you make things stay connected. Um, so finding the minimum height homology, I believe is NP hard because I think it is cut with at least for certain tweaking the parameters and the settings correctly. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Lots of open questions. I don't know algorithms. I don't know complexity for many of these things on surfaces where we really care about them. Um, the, the graph drawing paper has convinced me that this is really connected to a lot of combinatorial parameters that are very well studied. Uh, so I, I think there's more to explore there. Um, I don't know how to generalize 
like I said, any of them to surfaces. They, they seem to get harder, but that's about all I can say. Um, and it occurs to me watching this, this last one at bullet point, I just added watching all the other talks. In a TDA workshop, the first thing anyone talks about is stability. And it, it didn't even occur to me to consider stability of homotopies, right? Of course, they're homotopies, they're wiggly, they're weird. But intrinsically, at least for some of these area versus height parameters, small bumps should lead to small changes. That's actually, as far as I'm aware, completely open. Um, intuitively, it seems like some of these should be stable, but I'm, I'm not, I don't know if, if any other stability results would apply to this setting, given that we're doing sort of combinatorial homotopies. Okay, there's a lot more interesting variants. I didn't even get to area. Sorry, it's not enough time. Turns out area is much easier and you can study it also, uh, but that's maybe another time. So thank you. Thank you so much. So before we get to questions, let's briefly unmute ourselves and apply. Oh, I have a quick question. I was thinking this the whole time, and then at the end, you mentioned area, which is what you're not going to talk about. But sorry. Uh, no, no, it's OK. Um, and um, you also mentioned um, curvature, which I think is the first time I've heard the word um, here, um, but it's something that's dear to my heart as a Riemannian geometer. And so, um, so putting those two things together, um, I'm wondering if anyone, this may be a naive question, but I mean, does anyone involve the Gauss-Bonnet theorem? I mean, you're dealing with surfaces, right? So yes, to understand these things. Absolutely, in the combinatorial setting, uh, at least this is, depends on who you talk to. But um, whenever you're talking about geodesics and trying to argue where things are, that's often hidden in some of the proofs. Um, that would probably be more in the homotopy height stuff because the, the homotopic crochet sure has largely been studied in the plane, and there, I mean, you could use Gauss-Bonnet, but you could just use the Jordan curve theorem too, right? Like the, the curvature really comes becomes interesting on the surfaces. Um, that's hidden in there. Now, I haven't looked at whether we can exploit that more seriously. Um, that was an interesting question. Thanks. And it, like I said, I can I can absolutely follow up with the papers for area. We've, we've got algorithms for both homotopy area and homology area. And they're, like I said, more tractable. Maybe it's surprising, maybe not. You have to sweep the area, but parameterizing with a leash is somehow intrinsically much harder, uh, which is one of the reasons I focused on it. I think there's more work to be done in the area. Okay, thanks. I'll follow up. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Excellent. More questions? Erin, I was hoping you could explain the um, sort of subtle connection between homotopy height and width again. So you had a slide on this where you, you know, you, you yeah. Um, add, mm -hmm. yeah, I was, yeah, I was hoping you could give me a second chance at that one. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Right so, so this is sort of a, a restricted variant of homotopy height. So I'm assuming here's my top curve and here's my bottom curve. And I've given you a starting and an ending leash, the red and the blue on the sides here. And the goal is to sweep the disk, right, with your leash while walking along P and Q. Okay, so if you want to sort of connect that to homotopy height or, or somehow loosely connect them, over here I'm adding very, very low weight edges to a common cone vertex, only from P and Q. Right, so let me actually draw and maybe that'll help. Um, so over here, if I have a leash here, that would translate to some cycle. So if I over here ask you for the minimum leash going along, that's the same as contracting the outer curve, or rather it gives a way to contract the outer to the inner. So this is kind of a fake annulus and granted I'm restricting my setting a bit for the homotopic cliche, but nonetheless, they actually really do sort of seem connected. Um, just it, by tweaking this setting, I can say, well, if you can solve the one, if you can solve homotopy for Shea, you can give me a homotopy height that shrinks the thing optimally. And it, it's a bit of a, like, I, I have to be able to set these edge parameters so that they're negligible. So that really the cost over here is just paid by the edges in Sigma. Um, and then that works accordingly. And it's sort of a one-sided connection if you, under, if you understand yes. the least one. Yeah. 
Absolutely, although um, there's connected in a different way. So when we first started studying homotopy height, what we were actually was saying was you want to sweep from the left side to the right side from L to R. Ah, my pen is not cooperating. Um, so this sweep over um, somehow also encodes what it would be to sweep them both down. Uh -huh. Right, like I'm giving you a set of level curves. The, the, the connection is a little more subtle, but actually that does give me a homotopy. I could instead sandwich those together using the same intermediate leashes and form a homotopy to nothing. Mm -hmm. And this one here is not a far cry from, well, you've made this a point, but what if it's not a point? What if it's two curves? And then we're right back to homotopic for Shay, to this. Right. So, it, they're more connected than I realized when we were first. They seemed very orthogonal to me. And, and depending on your setting and your input and your shape, um, there's more connections than I realized. Thanks. Further questions? Well, if not, thanks so much, Aaron. And uh, Sanuk, did you have a question? Oh, my bad. Thanks so much, Aaron, and let's uh, stop the recording.